welcome to DACOM Digital. It's time to listen to the latest crypto and DeFi market integrity news and enlightening interviews with industry thought leaders. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of DACOM Digital, uh, the show where we host conversations with the builders, movers, and shakers of safe crypto and DeFi. Uh, and today is a very exciting day. We have the opportunity of hosting Rebecca Reddig uh, from Ave Company. It's wonderful to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, I think you and I met originally, the first time we interacted was a panel at the LA Blockchain Summit, which I think was one of like, it was the very peak of COVID. I really remember that it was still kind of new to host, uh, you know, to do full, full conf- uh, conferences that way. Um, but, you know, it's funny to think how much has happened since on the front of crypto regulation. I think that's what the panel was about. Um, obviously, um, a lot of change uh, for you. And, we'll, and I'm really excited to ask you about your journey a little bit. I'll just mention one more thing. One of the many reasons I really appreciate Rebecca is because uh, she uh, appreciated our Solidus Tide pens. Uh, anyone who's spent enough time with me has definitely gotten a Solidus Tide pen. And I remember the first time I gave one to you, you tweeted about it. It yes. just warmed my heart. So, you know, uh, I'm just sharing the love back. So thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so how about we start, you know, before we go into what is DeFi, before we go into what Ave does, uh, you know, I've never heard a story about a crypto risk or legal professional that isn't interesting. So how about we start with a little bit about you, your journey into law, and then into uh, what you're doing today? Sure. So I started my journey just um, as a litigation and regulatory enforcement lawyer at a big law firm in New York called Cravath. One of the cases I worked on while I was there was the LimeWire peer-to-peer file sharing case, which was my first real introduction into peer-to-peer technology and the intersection of that type of no intermediary technology and uh, law and regulation. And um, maybe if you know I wasn't where I am today, it wouldn't feel like such a seminal part of my career, but it really does today seem like the beginning of uh, where I started thinking about law and technology. Um, I spent a long time at Cravath, uh, but I also took two clerkships. My second one, I was working in the Southern District of New York, and I would take the train down from the Upper West Side every day to the courthouse, and I would read the Wall Street Journal. And I read an article about Bitcoin and Mt. Gox, very deep, deep, because this was in 2013. It was like very deep in the back of the business section of the Wall Street Journal. And I was really interested and really at that point felt like this is a Uh, you know, magic internet money. But I also felt intuitively that there would be some importance in the law relating to it. Um, And fast forward a few years from there, and I really thought, you know, I'm ready to do something entrepreneurial with my legal career. And I was still interested in crypto. So I started working on crypto cases, private arbitrations, mostly uh, just from a litigation perspective, but then really put myself out there. Um, I spoke on some panels in 2017 about crypto and regulation. Um, when you said a lot has changed, a lot has changed, but a lot hasn't changed. Yeah, it, it um, wasn't quite as popular to talk about crypto regulation uh, in 2017. No, <laughs> no, but one of the things I talked about back then, and I'll never forget it because um, I was on the panel with one of my good friends who's still in crypto and a lawyer, is we said there was going to be a lot of regulation by enforcement from the SEC, and we're still seeing hmm. a lot of that today. Um, But we are also, we have moved the ball forward a lot. So hopefully we'll get to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, And so I really decided to dedicate much of my practice to the space uh, starting in 2017 and just took on a lot of crypto cases, a lot of crypto founders, uh, and then I took on a very special client in 2019 before anything was called DeFi when we were still talking about it as OpenFi. And <laughs> from that point forward, really started focusing on DeFi and the intersection of how do we even think about regulation and our laws as they are built today, which they are really built for intermediaries. Um, and in this, you know, intermediary list, permissionless environment. So I started doing that in 2019. And um took on a lot of uh, DeFi software developers as clients. And then in a year and a half ago, uh, I was approached about being general counsel at the Ave Companies, met with Stani, and the rest is history. Wow. You know, honestly, there's so much to unpack there that I feel like we could spend the whole uh, 20, 30 minutes of the episode just talking about your journey because it's really kind of crazy how we don't think often enough about some of these kind of groundbreaking cases like LimeWire, like Mount Gox, um, and, and, you know, it's really cool that you were, you know, kind of so attentive and, and that it, it made you realize that there's going to be such a big issue. I guess the other thing I'd say about this is just that 
you know, oftentimes people think about innovation, I mean, naturally as technology, right? Like it's all about how well you write the code, uh, how well you integrate the APIs, uh, et cetera. But it, if you ask me, some of the most innovative work in crypto is actually on the legal side. It's about how do you take these very, you know, innovative, often complex financial products and you make them something that the, the general public can have access to in a very regulated financial ecosystem. So, uh, you know, uh, the legal, if you ask me, the, the legal entrepreneur, which you clearly are from your story, Thank you. is just a really important actor in this space. Um, and I'll take that into the next question, which is, you know, we, we sometimes take for granted and just, you know, you said it used to be open fine. Now we call it DeFi. What do we actually mean when we say DeFi? Um, yeah. And just a heads up, the next question is going to be, what does Ave do in DeFi? But let's start with what is DeFi? Sure. So um, DeFi or decentralized finance refers to an open software system, which allows users to engage in economic activities without the need for intermediaries. Uh, some of the transactions in DeFi are simple peer-to-peer -peer transfer of value, right? I would think of Bitcoin as the precursor to DeFi. Um, and then some of the economic transactions or economic activities in DeFi are more complex, look somewhat similar to transactions in the legacy financial system, but they obviously differ because there are no intermediaries involved and they are all facilitated through software. Um, so the code that DeFi is built on are called smart contracts. They're computer programs that are stored on blockchains and they're both conditional and automatic. And the software ensures that all transactions can occur at the user's direction. So there's no intermediary that needs to like push a button or approve the transaction. Uh, and then you've heard about, you know, DeFi protocols. You said we're going to talk about Aave in a minute. So we call it the Aave protocol. Um, this is a compilation of smart contracts or this, you know, automatic software code. And the protocols and the code underlying them lay out the rules of the road for all users and it's completely open on the internet. So uh, it's open source code and that users basically can see and understand the rules of the road before they engage in any of the transactions. That is, I mean, super helpful, honestly. Uh, you know, I feel like, you know, I've heard so many different definitions of DeFi, but once in a while you hear one that is, you know, helps you figure it out even better. Uh, and, and I felt like that did it. I think one, you know, one thing that's confusing for a lot of people is this question of decentralization, because I think that if you're deep in crypto and DeFi like us, then, you know, there's a really big difference between CeFi, yeah. centralized crypto and DeFi. Yes. You know, one kind of, I'm curious whether you'd agree with me, but oftentimes when I kind of, someone asks me, what, what is the actual difference? You know, so, you know, the intermediary is a big piece of it, but I also like to think about it as, as about DeFi as financial services that operate directly off of the blockchain unlike a centralized service where, you know, you would be buying Bitcoin, let's say on, on Coinbase, but in practice, the activity doesn't take place on the blockchain because it happens through Bitcoin. Um, do you feel like that's redundant or does it complement your, your, your description? It, it, so it complements how I think about decentralization. When I've been doing this, of course, very recently, we've had to talk a lot about what's the difference between CeFi and DeFi, including for things that have called themselves DeFi and are not. My explanation is if you cannot see where it happens in the code, right? You don't know where the yield is coming from. So something like Anchor, which had such significant yield and you couldn't see in the code where it was coming from, you right. know that there's a centralized actor that is handling that off chain, right? Or it's being handled off chain by some sort of group or individual. Um, so I agree with you that the open source code and being able to see everything is a really important part of decentralization. I usually talk about decentralization in three prongs, right? Technological, so the open source part of it. Governance, so is all the decision making decentralized through a DAO or some other mechanism? And then ecosystem. Uh, so are you thinking about the protocol and anything around it being built out by many, right? Lots of actors in the system and you're not relying on one central intermediary to build the protocol in any way, shape or form. Again, super helpful. Lists of threes in general are just really I love easy threes. to remember. Yeah, yeah. So, so super helpful. And you know what? Let, let's take it to the to the next phase, which is okay. Uh, you know, Ave companies and, and the Ave, Ave protocol, or I guess sure. protocols. Uh, so, what is Ave's role within this reality of a decentralized financial yeah. services? 
So that's a great question. So the Aave companies are just a group of software development companies. We build open source blockchain based software for the Web3 world. Um, we have built the Aave protocol, which I'll talk about in a second, but we also build other types of software. The goal or the mission that Stani, our founder, has put forward is to create software that shifts all of our paradigms from one that is centralized into one that is user owned. So we also mm. created a decentralized social media protocol, which means users can own their own data and still engage in social media. And the other piece of it is when you think about having a user owned internet, you think about it enabling privacy. So I think of DeFi as enabling financial privacy and something like decentralized social media, enhancing data privacy. And we can keep you know, building that out as we continue building out Web3. But uh, as far as the Aave protocol and how it works in DeFi, and as you said, it is a very uh, large protocol, an important piece of the DeFi ecosystem. Uh, we call it a liquidity protocol. It allows you to supply and borrow crypto assets. You can earn interest on your supplied crypto assets, and then you can also borrow against them. Uh, all borrowing is over collateralized on the Aave protocol. So you must put in more crypto assets value wise than you borrow. But uh, we've seen that almost as a proxy for credit worthiness, especially in the recent crunch that we've seen in the crypto ecosystem and over collateralization has seemed to work. People really come back and have, um, you know, unwound their borrowed transactions and withdrawn their collateral just to make sure they can get you know the value of their collateral back and the like. So that's what the Aave protocol does. At its peak during the bull market, it had 30 billion of total value locked. Uh, and in terms of the decentralization we talked about, it is all open source. So all the code for the Aave protocol is open and able to use on the internet, as well as for any front end, there is open source code there. It is controlled by a DAO. Uh, so the Aave DAO is over 100,000 unique wallet addresses that hold the Aave governance token. They can make proposals to change the protocol and they can mm. vote on those proposals. And as far as, you know, my third part of the ecosystem, it's a very robust ecosystem. There are over there are hundreds of on ramps and and ways to get into the protocol. There are tons of builders on top of the protocol and in the protocol themselves and uh, there are also risk managers uh, and other types of service providers who make proposals to the protocol to make sure that they are contributing to the ecosystem in a meaningful way. Wow. <laughs> I have so, <laughs> that, that, no, that was, that, that, you know, no, no matter how many times I, I read about it, every time I hear someone from the team explaining it, it's even more compelling. And I have a million questions, but you know what? Uh, you know, I have questions about risk. I have questions about accessibility. I have questions about regulation and about, Balancing all of those, but before that, um, you know, let's talk about you know a lot of the conversation. You know, after the markets clashed a little bit in, in, in mainstream media, it crashed a little bit in mainstream media was about um, <clears throat> you know use cases. Why is this useful? Why is it needed? And I have a feeling that you know from your vantage point, uh, you know, I mean, you see, you have you know, as you mentioned, pretty large volumes. People are using it. Um, you know, how do you feel like this? It makes the world better. If it's okay to ask. Sure. I mean, that's a very, I think, philosophical question. I probably could answer that, and but we'd need like three or four podcasts to do that. But just <laughs> hey, by the way, a, I, I, you're, not, you're not scaring me. I would love to have you here three or four more times. <laughs> so let's start with this. Um, very few people want to have lawyers on their podcast three or four times, but so you're special in that way for sure. But in all seriousness, I mean, look, I think the narrative that's also come out of it is that DeFi stood up during this, you know, market uh, constriction and this and this unexpected set or maybe expected set of market events. True DeFi withstood and worked exactly as it was supposed to. So yes, there may have been liquidations, but they were liquidations that users knew about. They knew how they would work. It was open and transparent. Different than something like a Celsius, which would shut down your whole account all at once and you couldn't withdraw any of it. And now they're in bankruptcy. So you certainly can't get there for years once you go through the bankruptcy process. In a DeFi setting, even if you're liquidated, you're only liquidated partially. Uh, and then you have the chance to bring up your position. So having a user owned system where you can control your own financial fate should be extremely uh, attractive right now, I think, when we've seen some of these centralized actors make, uh, I would say, decisions out of hubris or poor risk management, speaking of risk. Um, but these are very akin to the types of decisions we've seen in the legacy financial world where centralized actors took on too much risk 
or didn't build out the risk parameters or see sort of things coming down from the market, um, it's the same. It's just a different asset class, right? So I think of long-term capital management, you know, where we see this big hedge fund that blew up, very similar to what happened with Celsius, honestly. I have to say that is such a good point. You know, I was, uh, I was thinking you, you, you would, you would give, you know, you, you would give, give me some user stories and, and how they use other, which I'm sure you have, but I think that on the, on the big picture, it's such an important point that actually just by, you know, uh, you know, functioning through, uh, you know, the, this, dr- these dramatic market events. I mean, DeFi proved one of its most important use cases, right? Yeah. That it's automated, it doesn't depend on people. And I also think uh, the, the point you added there at the end, I mean, we, we you know, we, you and I both, we speak in panels, et cetera. I always try to remind people that like, let us not forget that financial meltdowns because of terrible risk management happened more in traditional finance than they have happened, uh, you know, in, in, in crypto. I mean, obviously crypto is new and there's a lot of battle testing happening, but uh, really important to remember that, uh, you know, the majority of uh, money laundering by far happens in US dollars, not in crypto. And the same is true for other elements. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take us in the direction of risk. Uh, I've been thinking a lot over the past three, four months about 2008 uh, and about the fact that, you know, even though I read the big shorts uh, one time and watched the movie twice, it's still hard <laughs> to explain exactly what happened. They're very, very complex. Well, you know, we, you know, we, it takes books and books to actually explain. But the theme to me has always been, uh, you know, a growing amount of risk with, you know, kind of hidden within layers and layers of uh, complex financial products that are built on top of each other. And that's just become very, very hard to understand. You know, and, and you know what, maybe it's kind of important to say hard to understand, easier to ignore are two things uh, that are, you know, not exactly the same, but often go hand in hand. But bottom line, no, all the way from individual investors, uh, individual consumers at the time, obviously we're talking about the mortgage market, um, you know, large financial uh, institutions and investment banks and regulators, acad- academics, no one really understood the level of risk and did something about it. Um, and, you know, you're starting to see more complex financial products in DeFi and Terra is probably a good example. So I guess I'm kind of, you know, for me, the, the question of, you know, the, a, a big question for how is crypto market, the crypto and DeFi, industry is going to come out of this is about managing risks. And you obviously started touching this. So I'll just let you continue. (laughs) Yeah. So two things to say before I get into that in depth. Terra was not DeFi for exactly the reason we talked about. Its source was Anchor. There were definitely centralized elements there. And I don't think Terra itself was decentralized in a true way. I think there was a lot of centralization behind the scenes. So setting that aside, just to go back to 2008, I heard uh, a story, I think on a panel, I, I wish I could remember who I could attribute this story to, but Somebody told me that even today, they cannot find all of the assets that Lehman held back when it collapsed in 2008. And somebody at Lehman or somebody who was at Lehman then said, you know, if we had everything on the blockchain, we'd be able to trace back where all our assets were and have been able to, you know, either sell them or unwind them or handle them in the right way. So I do something I say frequently when I'm speaking to regulators and policymakers is um, blockchain is going to make your job easier. Right. You are going to be able to monitor risk and this financial system in real time and be able to see and anticipate certain events that you otherwise might not be able to see otherwise. Now, we won't be able to do that in the next year or two. It's going to take a while to build out the tools uh, for regulators um, to be able to watch the markets as closely as they want to and all the products across. But Solidus and others are obviously trying to work on building out those tools to look at you know, the system in real time. So I think that's really important is for the service providers who are thinking about compliance, blockchain analytics and the like. That's really important. The second piece on risk, and this goes to what the builders should be doing, especially in this bear market, is thinking about where you can build in crypto native or protocol native risk mitigation mechanisms. So uh, earlier this year, um, we built Ave V3 at the comp- at the community's request. And um, it has enhanced risk mitigation mechanisms that are built into it that can be enabled by the DAO. Things like debt ceilings that you can put in by pool, things wow. like being able to freeze one pool, but while others are still moving forward in terms of different assets, sometimes the, um, the DAO could enable something called e-mode or efficiency mode, where you can only borrow certain types of assets against each other and so narrowing. So I think it's really imperative 
um, for people not to be building just the next big protocol with the most or the next big version of their protocol with the most interesting mechanisms of complex products that you could build out there, but also ways for the community, uh, for users themselves to enable risk. Um, there's definitely a lot of crypto native compliance happening too uh, that will help mitigate risk. But I think those are really important things for builders to be thinking about right now. I mean, I completely agree. And you know what, first of all, because you, 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 you kind of, you, first of all, I just want to say that I agree with you. The Terra is not the great best example of decentralization for multiple reasons. Yeah. So just to second you there, because I'm the one who proposed that idea in the first place. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, super interesting stuff. Uh, and you know, you're kind of, it's music to my ears because we founded Solidus. you know, one of our core values is the fact that we're crypto native um, and that all of our solutions are designed for the ecosystem, it means that they have to adapt constantly. Uh, and when it comes to DeFi, it's a particularly fascinating and uh, you know fascinating world of really defining what market integrity means in DeFi. What is market manipulation in a decentralized context? Is it different? The, tr the answer is that oftentimes yes. Um, although there's still a lot we can learn from traditional markets. So anyway, just to say that uh, I you know we at Solidus wholeheartedly agree uh, the crypto native approaches to this is critical. Um, you know, uh, and, and you know, and I, I also want to say that one, one thing I tell regulators a lot when I meet with them is that our conversations with anyone in DeFi is fa are always fascinating. And one of the cool things about it is that while oftentimes risk solutions and kind of risk vendors sell very much based on legal, uh, you know, FUD, uh, you know, uh, 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 and what was interesting when we started working more and more with uh, decentralized, various kinds of decentralized communities, protocols, DAOs, uh, et cetera, was that there's a real focus on market uh, on user experience. Yes, the law is there, and obviously, uh, you know, smart companies are bringing in very smart lawyers like you in order to uh, look at those risks. But first and foremost, it's just a realization that you know consumer protections needs to be figured out in a DeFi context. Market integrity needs to be figured out in a De DeFi context. Anti money laundering as well, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to do it exactly the same way, but you need to do something about it. And uh, no question that Ave has been leading the way on that front. How how do you feel? Uh, you know those the, the kind of emphasized focus on 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 risk monitoring on on um, consumer protection. Uh, you know uh, interacts with this question of decentralization because obviously it's a big question. Uh, it's a big ideological question. We would say in the industry, uh, there's always a balance there. Uh, you know. What are your thoughts kind of being uh, deep in those uh, conversations and efforts? Yeah, so I think it's a complicated question um, because DeFi is different than anything we've ever contemplated before and anything that our regulations ever contemplated because our financial or economic regulations are all trained on intermediaries precisely because when humans have control over other people's assets, you want to make sure that their judgment is controlled and that they handle other people's assets correctly. When you have a piece of software handling other people's assets, uh, you're going to have to figure out how to meet your regulatory goals in a new way, because there are two things we really don't want to do. We do not want to regulate the writing of code, right? That's going to stifle innovation in the U.S. It certainly uh, violates the First Amendment. In other places, you certainly don't want to you know, impinge on people's free speech. And then the other, on the other end of it, right, after it's deployed into a decentralized state, you don't want to turn software developers into financial intermediaries. So right. the question is, where's the right inflection point to be able to ensure that all of the consumer protection and other regulatory goals, so market integrity, AML, and stuff like that exist? Some of it is the protocols are going to have to be built to be able to be integrated with different parts of a system. And I really don't mean, okay, we're going to need KYC protocols that use traditional KYC vendors and just KYC you like you would do at, at a bank. You're going to have to think about digital identity in a new way where you ensure that people on the SDN list or otherwise, you know, are from sanctioned countries can be blocked in some way, shape or form, or users themselves can have the option to integrate some sort of Oracle into their own wallet, things like that. But we cannot think about it the same way we do in the legacy financial system, because then what we're really going to do is turn it into fintech. And then it's not so interesting or special anymore, because you're not, you know, look, we talk a lot about banking the unbanked or how 
DeFi and blockchain is sort of the great equalizer. I think we have to be intellectually honest that we're not there yet. But I think if we actually work with regulators to innovate and policymakers around what we can do with DeFi and this special system to be able to meet regulatory goals in, as you said, a crypto native compliant way, then we are going to be able to really unlock the real promise that this technology has and to build out what the internet is today, just in a whole new way. Uh, what would you say is the, uh, let's double click, as they say, in Silicon Valley. <laughs> uh, I think that's where it comes from. I'm still, Neither I'm still of us the... are in Silicon Valley right, <laughs> right now, but we can do that. So yeah, so we could also uh, uh, accuse them uh, of, of using that sentence, or at least I can. Uh, but okay. let's double click first on this question of accessibility, because, because to me, you know, accessibility obviously is wonderful. It's an exalted value that we're all committed to. I think there are very few people who would say they're not in favor of accessibility. Uh, you know, decentralized services and DeFi definitely offer something unheard of when it comes to accessibility, just something that anyone can access. But I go back to something that you t- mentioned earlier, and that was reading the code, right? Um, sure. It's, it, you know, the transparency of being, the code being there on the one hand is obviously amazing, but... Uh, does it also make it less relevant for people who can't read code or, you know, just would never? Uh, I think it's also a really interesting question that, uh, you know, the industry is trying to figure out. And curious, what are your thoughts? Sure. So I think there are two pieces to it. I think all the best um, DeFi software developers have put out amazing docs pages and make sure that what they disclose about how the protocol works, both works for developers and for normies or people who are just not as engaged with the code. I think the other really easy hurdle for DeFi software developers to jump over from a regulatory perspective is certainly disclosure regimes, right? Or notice and disclosure regimes. That seems to be a very easy first step it goes directly to consumer protection, which if you build any product, doesn't matter what product you build, consumer protection laws apply. Um, and so asking or you know, working with regulators to build out a fair notice and disclosure regime where you have both the way that the software works disclosed and the risks disclosed should be a very easy first step to your point. No, 100%. I think, you know, and I, and I agree with you completely. I think that uh, regulators are over time realizing that there are actually a lot of advantages from the regulatory vantage point, uh, you know, I thought that the DOJ's announcement when they uh, were able to recover the Bitfinex funds, right? The, you know, and the fact that it was the largest ever recovery of funds in the history of the DOJ because, and the judge says so in their decision, it was on a blockchain, was kind of like a watershed moment where uh, regulators are like, yes, this actually works better uh, from various uh, in various ways. So I, I completely agree with you. And I think that the next step is, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. How can regulators help by, you know, for example, providing, uh, you know, uh, disclosure requirements and maybe even, I don't know, uh, you know, have a look at them, kind of, there needs to be standardization there. So I'll take that to, you know, my, you know, uh, one of my last questions, and that is about regulation. You've touched it a number of times, Um, but in general, uh, it's one of the biggest questions now, how, what, how can regulators, you know, promote consumer protection, promote market integrity, but at the same time, don't stifle innovation? Uh, you know, and how can the industry help them uh, regulate constructively? Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, great question. So I've been saying this for a while, but I want everyone in the DeFi space to engage constructively, right? When you said like, it's very hard to figure out what's a good definition of DeFi, what's a good definition of decentralization, we should be out there talking about it in a pretty unified way, for one. I think the days of hoping, you know, that people don't realize that DeFi is there are well over. Everyone is, including policymakers and regulators, are very well aware that DeFi is there and that it is something that has a lot of interest and a lot of promise. And then the last piece of it is, to your point, you have to be engaging constructively because if we do not engage and put forward some proactive idea of good policy for DeFi, then we are either left to people who don't understand the technology, creating things that just aren't gonna work with DeFi. So basically turning software developers into financial intermediaries, or we are going to be left with people and actors in the legacy financial world who are nervous about crypto eating their lunch or eating into their market share in the financial world and suggesting regulation that will 
either turn us into banks or the like, or um, otherwise undercut the technology. So it's really incumbent upon us in the DeFi space to be working on an affirmative proposal. And whatever we put forward first will not be the end game for sure, but we have to put forward an affirmative proposal and be engaging with regulators on a regular basis and policymakers on a regular basis to hear what they're thinking, to explain the technology to them, and to start thinking about how we can achieve all the goals of traditional regulation in a crypto native way. Uh, and, and again, I, you know, I, it, it's just great to hear you say this and, and especially, you know, and, and just to know that there are people focused on that in every, you know, on in the DeFi space uh, who come with a traditional legal knowledge and, and keep on innovating with it to enable crypto. Um, you know, uh, it, Anyway, it's been just so wonderful to speak with you. I guess uh, just before we finish, I'm curious to ask you if there's anything else that you think we should have talked about and didn't, or is just it's important for you to uh, to uh, to uh, to share with the audience, with our audience. Uh, the last piece is what I really care about: that people are out there and engaging, even if you don't want to engage directly. The Ave companies do. Uh, we are out there, certainly talking to regulators and policymakers in the U.S., the U.K., and the EU. So people should feel free to reach out and talk about either how they can get involved. Um, always happy to hear people's feedback about where they think there is a, you know, a good point of inflection for regulation. Um, but we are going to have to be willing to accept something more than what we have today, but also be able to push back on being regulated as financial intermediaries for sure. Right. Well, so sending everyone away with us important message. It's about us. It's about us as an industry engaging with regulators, I can share from my own experience, they definitely want to engage as well and learn. Um, and, you know, you said it early, you know, early in the conversation, Rebecca, that uh, you, you called back in 2017 or was it 2013? No, uh, 2017. Uh, that, that oh. 2017, right. That you, you called it, right. That um, concerns about crypto are going to lead to regulation by enforcement. Uh, yeah. That's definitely been happening. Um, yeah. And, and the other piece of that is, you know, uh, you know, kind of token is a uh, title sevenization or just very prescript, prescriptive legislation and regulation, which is not necessarily most helpful. And it's exactly, as you said, our work, our job, our responsibility to demonstrate crypto's integrity uh, and work with regulators to help propose those more constructive regimes. So uh, thank you not only for joining us today, but for doing that every day and for building a safe uh, crypto ecosystem. Uh, uh, thank you for this amazing report from the trenches, Rebecca. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And we got into some of the hard questions. So thanks so much. No, no, of course. And I look forward to having you here again. I, I wasn't kidding. Uh, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think this is definitely one of many, I hope. Uh, have a wonderful uh, rest of the week. And thanks for joining me. Thank you. You too. Thanks so much for having me. This episode of DACOM Digital was brought to you by Solidus Labs. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe and be sure to join the conversation by following us on LinkedIn and Twitter.